Our scripture reading today comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, in days of trouble, we seek you. We know and we declare that your steadfast love will never cease. When times are hard, we remember you and we remember your deeds, that your way, O oh God, is holy. There is no God great like you. You alone work wonders and make known your might among the peoples. God, I also pray as Cody did for Afghanistan. God, may the weak be protected. May evil be thwarted. May those wronged be given justice. And would you comfort the brokenhearted? God, I pray for our government to gain wisdom, to gain righteousness. And God, we pray for the church in Afghanistan that you would strengthen them. Even this morning, as I know thousands and thousands and thousands of church across the nation are pleading your throne corporately to strengthen them. Strengthen their hope. May they look to you. And God, in this trial, would you show yourself strong? Would you use this as an opportunity to spread the gospel and ultimately grow the church? What an opportunity. I pray for strength hands, strengthened hands, that hope would be steadfast in days of trouble that we can't even imagine. May the blood of the martyrs be the seed of the church. God, I pray for many among us that are sick. I pray for those that are sick that you would bring healing. And God, I pray that all of us, as we are sick at various times and experience various trials, God, that in the midst of it, we would look to you, we would seek to you, we would remind ourselves of your goodness and your grandness. It is hard to have perspective when we're down and out. And so I pray for the strength of this congregation to be able to do that. Would you help us to be able to gain perspective and honor you in all things? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but your word stands forever. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Amen. Did you hear about the Baptist church that had the mice problem? They were all over the place. They had nests everywhere in the attics. They were in the kitchen cabinets. They couldn't get rid of the mice. They tried all sorts of things. You name it, they tried it. It just wouldn't work. These mice were persistently present until one shrewd deacon had an idea. He said, let's baptize the mice. <laughs> and it worked. Now they only see them at Christmas and Easter. <laughs> We're kicking off a six-week series called Membership Matters. If you're new with us, normally we just walk through books of the Bible, so we've been in the book of Matthew for quite some time, and after these six weeks, we'll jump back into the book of Matthew for college students uh, among us that are first-time guests. Welcome. Really glad you're here. Really encouraged by uh, sitting up here in front of you and hearing you praise the Lord. I've, I heard you, and I'm like, y'all belong here. I don't need to be here. <laughs> but two things I want to just mention to you. Number one, find a church that preaches the Bible. Life is too short to go to churches that don't preach the Bible. Number two, find a place and plug in. Plug in. In many ways, this series, this six-week series is timed for you. 
So I know you may want to visit other churches, but I would encourage you to consider what's said this morning and maybe even listen online, website, podcast, YouTube, and what I'm saying, because we think membership matters. And I really wish you could get time with some of our junior and senior members and talk to them how a church that practices meaningful church membership will change your life. You'll leave here and never be the same. So that's what we're going to talk about. Membership matters. It's a double entendre. It's taken in two ways. We're going to discuss the matters of membership. We're going to see that membership matters probably more than you think. And my aim in this series is to change the way you think about the local church and therefore change the way you think about the Christian life. That you'll come to see that the Christian life is the churched life. So here's the plan. We're going to have this sermon this morning on the nature of the church. What is this thing? Then next week we'll have one on church leadership. And then we'll have two, really three, on membership and discipline. And then one on discipleship in the local church. Really the whole thing, though, is about meaningful local church membership. We talk a lot about the church, right? Here we are. We go to church. We attend church services. Leaders are consumed with church growth. How can the church grow But what is it? What is the church? Normally, we think about the building, right? I just said it, right? We go to church, but that's not quite right. The church is not a place. The church is a people, but it is a people who gather together in a place. This word church, the word is ecclesia. It's found 114 times in the New Testament. And the vast majority, 92 or 93 of those 114 times, it's referring to the local church church. So when you hear church, you ought to think local, the church at Corinth or the church at Rome or the church at Ephesus. And the church can be defined as a group of Christians who jointly identify as followers of Jesus through regularly gathering in his name, preaching the gospel and celebrating the ordinances. We are a church that takes doctrine very seriously. Our confession is called the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, and it's long, but I want to read the definition of the church in the Baptist Faith and Message, our confession. Notice it's long, and in many ways, the next five weeks, we'll be unpacking what this means. A New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous, meaning self-ruling, no one tells this church what to do from the outside, local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ through democratic processes. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord. Its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture, end quote. So again, the next six weeks in some ways is gonna be unpacking this definition. How important then, that's what the church is, how important should the church be in the life of a Christian? In short, very central even. We're talking about the blood-bought bride of Christ. The group of people Jesus shed his blood to obtain. You remember when Saul in the book of Acts was persecuting the church and the Lord Jesus knocks him off his horse and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Is that what he says? It's not what he says in Acts chapter 9, verse 4. The Lord Jesus Christ says, why are you persecuting me? Because if you mess with Jesus' people, you're messing with Jesus. There's an organic connection between the head and the body. The church is the body. He is the head. Listen to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. To me, Paul's writing, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that, what's the plan? Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal 
purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you catch that? God's plan for the ages, his eternal purpose for all time. This was his plan. His plan A was to save a group of people and unite them around his son, Jesus Christ. And it's through that that he's displaying his glory to the watching world. In fact, here it says the principalities and powers. I think it's demons and angels. God is going to communicate to them, your days are numbered. I'm going to do to the whole world what I'm doing through the church, uniting them around Jesus. And so they're put on notice. The local church is the focal point of God displaying his glory and his wisdom. The church is at the center of God's plan, according to these verses. It's the apple of God's eye. And so the question is, it is, the, is it the apple of your eye? Let's consider the nature of the church and let's look at four marks of the church. We're going to be in the, Jeremiah chapter 31. If you don't have a Bible, grab a Bible from in front of you in the chair and it's going to be page 618. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. You got one main point that I'd like you to take away this morning and that is that the church is a believing people. It consists of believers. Therefore, we ought to have a regenerate church membership. That'll make more sense in a moment. First mark of the church. The church is the community of the new covenant. Look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Jeremiah is prophesying from his perspective, the future. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So here God promises to make a new covenant with his people. Well, what's a covenant? Very simply, it's just a promise. It's a commitment, right? There, there are six main biblical covenants. God creates the world and that's the first covenant with Adam. He makes promises to them. Adam blows it, right? And so there's uh, sin falling. God judges the world through the flood, but he calls out a, a new Adam in a sense, right? Noah, and he makes a covenant with Noah and promises I'll never again destroy the world. Things go bad with Noah, there's still sin. And so God pulls this guy named Abram out and makes a covenant with Abram and said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your, your name great. I'm going to make a whole nation out of you and out of your family, the whole world will be blessed. And that's what happens. And so there's this covenant with Israel. They became a nation, but things still go wrong like they often do with sinful people. They blow it on their wedding night in so many ways. Old covenant Israel does. So God's not done though. He's not going to let his people go. He continues. And so he promises and he raises up one descendant named David and says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to raise up a son who's going to be an eternal ruler. He's going to be the king of the world. Things are still broken though, right? David was very fallen. David's sons were very fallen. So the prophets begin to promise a new covenant. And this is what we have right here in Jeremiah 31. Something still needed to be done. God needed to fix the problem. And so you'll just notice already that we've read and that Melissa read, notice how many times God says, I will, I will, I will make a new covenant. I will make it with the house. I will write it on their hearts. I will. Seven times God's saying, I'm going to fix the problem and I'm going to do so through a new covenant people. So the church is God's new covenant people. It's new. It's new in the plan of God. God didn't just drop this book out of the sky. He revealed himself over time. And so the new covenant is the fulfillment of all God's other promises. And notice what he says there. He says, it will not be like that other covenant, that old covenant, the one that they broke. This new covenant will be effective, not like that one. The author of Hebrews, much later, Hebrews chapter 8, he quotes Jeremiah 31. This whole passage, he quotes it and applies it to the church. But notice how he describes it right before he quotes it. He says this, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant, the old covenant, had been faultless, there would be no occasion to look for a second. But it wasn't faultless and the people weren't faultless. Something needed to change. Something needed to be done. And so here we have the promise that the new covenant will come and it will replace the old covenant. 
It'll make the old covenant obsolete, as Hebrews will say. It'll make it expired. You know, Alicia and I are finally getting out of the sippy cup stage. We've got five kiddos, 11 to four. And so we're out of the sippy cup stage, which is kind of nice, but also kind of sad. And we would sometimes lose those sippy cups of milk. Can I get a witness? <laughs> we lost a, a sippy cup full of milk. You don't notice it for a few days. And then the van smells funny. The van stinks. What in the world is in the van? Finally, you locate it. You don't even try to open those, right? <laughs> those just go straight to the dump. The milk had expired. The old covenant had expired when Jesus came. He's the mediator of the new and better covenant, which replaces the old covenant. We don't go back to the old. What it pointed forward to has come. The candle becomes pointless when the sun rises. So number one, the church is the blood-bought community of the new covenant. Number two, the church, what is it? What's its nature? It's a regenerate community. Look at verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The church consists of those who've been regenerated, those who've been born again, those who've been changed from the inside out. The law of God's no longer just some external document written on stone. Now it's written on the human heart in the new covenants. This is part of what makes it new. What's new about the new covenant? It has power, as a mentor of mine used to say. The old covenant should have come with this sticker that said, batteries not included. Don't you hate that, kids? You've been wanting that Christmas gift. You unwrap it on Christmas morning. You're ready. Batteries not included. Wah, wah, wah. That's the old covenant. It's the old covenant. It's like an RC car, right? You can pull the trigger, but there's no power. There was the law telling them what to do, but they were not changed from the inside out. They needed that. They needed regeneration. They were sinful people. The Bible calls them stiff-necked. They were rebellious. Again, right from the start, right before. I mean, that covenant ceremony, and this is Exodus 19 and 20, God forms them, gives them the covenant, and what do they do? Just imagine this. Imagine a couple go through premarital counseling. They have their ceremony. They finally go wedding night, the night they're going to consummate the marriage, and one of them slips out, goes down the road, and is unfaithful. Adultery on their very wedding night. That's the story of Israel. Do you remember? God redeemed them out of Egypt. And what do they do? While Moses is away, they put their jewelry together, and they form a, a false god, an idol, and they give it the credit. Hard-hearted. Look again at verse 32. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. This one will be different. Israel had a heart problem. Flip back to Jeremiah chapter 7. Verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 24. Speaking of old covenant Israel, they did not obey or incline their ear, but they walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts. And they went backward, not forward. They had stubborn, evil hearts. That was their problem. Another image that Jeremiah uses is that they were uncircumcised in heart. It's kind of a strange image, isn't it? Their hearts had like this fatty foreskin on it that caused them not to be able to respond to God. Jeremiah says that as well. Flip back just a few pages to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. The command, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskin of your heart, so men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. They had uncircumcised hearts. Their hearts would not respond to God. They needed heart surgery. Flip over a few pages to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25. I'm just going to keep doing this so I can hear the turning of these pages. I'm digging it. 
Jeremiah 9, 25. Behold, the days are coming. Jeremiah 9, 25. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah. He throws Judah in with Egypt. Are you serious, Jeremiah? Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in hearts, hard-hearted, uncircumcised. Remember in the book of Acts, as Stephen is preaching right before he gets martyred, this is what he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. And so Jeremiah in our passage is speaking of the law being written on our heart, but way before Jeremiah in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses promises that God will, Jeremiah, I mean, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, God will circumcise their hearts. He's going to do it. It's the same, same point as Jeremiah is saying. The law will be written on the heart. God is going to fix their heart problem. That's why Paul can tell the Gentile Christian church in Philippi, you are the circumcision. Or he can tell the Roman church that circumcision is not outward and physical in the new covenant, but now it's a matter of the heart by the Spirit. They needed that inward transformation, and the new covenant was going to bring it. Ezekiel does the same thing, but he uses yet different imagery. He uses imagery of a stony heart. They have this heart of stone. It just is not working. God's telling them to obey, and their heart is not responding. And so he promises that in the new covenant, he'll take out that heart of stone, heart surgery, and put in a heart of flesh that will then respond to God so that they'll love him with all that they are. They needed that inward transformation. They needed regeneration. They needed new hearts, and one of the main gifts of the new covenant is exactly that. These promises about circumcision of the heart and the law written in and heart transplant, these all came to fulfillment at Pentecost as the Holy Spirit is poured out. And so when we believe in Jesus, we're filled with the Spirit. We have a new heart. We can now respond. The law has been written on our heart. And don't miss this. What Jeremiah is going to promise is this inward transformation, this regeneration, it would happen to every member of the new covenant community. And so the church is regenerate. The church consists of people who have been born again. All members of the new covenant community are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, unlike Israel of old. Third, the church is a believing community. Look at verse 34. And no longer, when this comes, no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. In the church, all know the Lord. This is one of the main ways that the new covenant community is different from the old covenant community. Right? The old covenant people of God, it was a mixed community. There were some believers, but there were also lots of unbelievers in that community. They all received the sign of the covenant. They were all included in that community, but really only a remnant believed, right? Yeah, we had David. He did okay. And then we had a bunch of Ahabs. There was Josiah, good king, but there were a vast majority were unfaithful kings. The history of Israel is the history of unfaithfulness and idolatry because they had a heart problem. But Jeremiah says, all that's going to change. There's a day coming called the new covenant where all that will be different. Then when that day comes, they shall all know me, declares the Lord. And he mentions that we won't need teachers. He's not meaning that we won't need teachers in any sense. That would contradict a whole lot of other passages. The teaching here, though, that he's mentioning, it's more than just transferring information. Jeremiah is looking forward to a time when there'll be no mediators, no priests, because they'll all be priests. They'll all have this access. They'll all have this personal knowledge of God. Every member, Jeremiah says, will know God personally. No more mediated knowledge. But Jesus is our only mediator. There's a new structure. We don't have to go through all those hoops in the new covenant. Notice the way this little proverb he gives us right before his prophecy. Look at Jeremiah 31, verse 29. Right before he says it. He says, in those days, they shall no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth 
are set on edge. In other words, what the fathers do, then the children will suffer for. Think about that in Israel. If the leadership of Israel went wrong, it went wrong for everybody. Jeremiah is saying there's a day coming when it won't be that way. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. There's no longer a situation in the new covenant where we have to have a temple and a priest because we're all priests. No more fallen kings. Jesus is our king. He's our priest. He's our mediator, and he makes us kings and priests. So now the church is filled with believers and believers only. Now, what does this have to do with church membership? This is a series on membership matters. It matters because it means that the church should consist of only believers. Like our confession of faith says, a New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel. It matters because we need to have, as local churches, a regenerate church membership. Now, maybe that term may be new to you, but I assure you it's a very old term. Baptist in particular, this is our contribution to the wider Christian world. And we've talked about a regenerate church membership since our inception. Let me read a statement from 1656. Some Baptists got together and they wrote this Somerset Confession. And here's what they say. In admitting of members into the church of Christ, it's the duty of the church and ministers whom it concerns in faithfulness to God that they be careful, they receive none but such as do make forth the evident demonstration of the new birth and the work of faith with power. It's a little bit wordy. It is from the 1700s after all, but what is he saying? Churches and the leaders should only let believers in and we should be careful to only let believers into the membership of the local church. There was another meeting in the early 1900s called the Baptist World Alliance and one of the leaders said this, the principle of a regenerated church membership where all know the Lord more than anything else marks our distinctiveness in the Christian world today, end quote. It's been called the cardinal point of the Baptist view of the church. It was in the very first confession, Baptist confession of faith. Now, other traditions, and many of you have other traditions. We're actually not a very Baptist church uh, at Southside, so many of you come from other traditions. And they haven't done this. They haven't practiced a regenerate church membership. Just consider those times where the state and the church were wedded. So if you were born in that state, if it was a state church, you were part of the church by birthrights. Think about church history. When Constantine became a Christian in 310, 311, the whole Roman Empire became Christian overnight. How many of those were believers? Very small amount, at least to begin with. And some other traditions include believers, but also their unbelieving babies and children. So Lutherans and Methodists and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Catholics. But even in-house, sometimes in more unhealthy Baptist churches or non-denominational churches, we've just let anyone join our church. Some of you grew up this way, right? Especially if you grew up in a Baptist circle. Oftentimes it would look like this. The pastor would get up and towards the end of the service, we would have, you know, just as I am, play 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 times, waiting on someone to come, walk the aisle. And then finally someone would walk the aisle and maybe they wanted to join the church. And there was always that sweet little lady She always had that ledger, like locked and loaded, didn't she? So come down, sit down, get the information, you know, whoever it was, and say it was, you know, it was Charlie Jones. And then you tell the pastor, whoever the pastor gets up, hey, Charlie Jones wants to join the church. Uh, All in favor say aye, aye. All opposed, no. No one says anything. We don't know anything about Charlie. Charlie may have been Chester Molester Mormon. We don't know, but we just add him to the church. (laughs) We know nothing about him. Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're making the church impure when we add unbelievers. We pollute it. And this is just not how Baptists have operated historically. And I would argue it's not how the Bible would have us. Baptists would often get together and cooperate different churches and usually around a doctrine, a confession. And at one point they got together and this was in the Charleston, so South Carolina Baptist Association that formed in the early 1700s. They wrote up for their churches. Their churches already back then were ignorant on church discipline. So they got together and said, hey, let's write a document so that our churches will understand biblical church discipline. And here's what they wrote. 
It was called the Summary of Church Discipline. And they said that when churches allow unconverted people to crowd into them, they, quote, make the church of Christ a harlot, end quote. And so everything I'm going to lay out for the next six weeks is just old school Baptist practice. 18th century Baptist practice. Just FYI, that's where I'm from. I am your great, great Baptist grandfather. Come back from the past. But I got verses in hand. And this is actually tragic, friends, because too many churches have lost this practice. They've lost meaningful membership. On any given Sunday, two-thirds, 66% of the members of Baptist churches are not in attendance on Sunday mornings. Two-thirds, except for Christmas and Easter. You'll have churches after churches after churches that have 1,000 people on their membership rolls, 2,000 people on their membership rolls, and 200 in attendance on Sunday morning. What happened to the other 1,800 people that you let into the church? See, churches and their leaders have stopped practicing meaningful membership. They've stopped or maybe never started practicing biblical church discipline. There'll be a whole sermon or two on that. And of course, regenerate church membership, it's tied to believer's baptism. And often churches have, they've baptized children way too early before they're ready. Kids are often impressionable and so that maybe they want to be like their friend or maybe they want to please their parents. And so we just baptize them without even asking them any questions. And then they, they really didn't know what they were doing. They hadn't yet been converted. They didn't understand the gospel and they grow up and they walk away. But they've got this false assurance because one time when they were six, they were baptized in a church. We've focused on getting decisions rather than making disciples. We focus on quantitative growth rather than qualitative growth. We've been driven by numbers. We've been too fearful of accountability, too worldly rather than holy, too pragmatic rather than principled, too cowardly rather than courageous. And the country is filled, the city is filled with unhealthy, bloated churches as a result. Friends, the need in the church, the need in the community, the need in the culture are strong, healthy churches churches. And the first step to getting there is regenerate church membership. A church of believers, a church of saints, holy ones, only believers, different from the world, a city set on a hill, a light in a dark place. So how do we do that? Well, let me tell you how we do it here. If you've joined here in the last four years, you already know all this, but let me just tell you what we do. So you're here, you've been around, you've visited, you decide, you know what, I want to join. You sign up for our next membership class. We try to offer them four or five times a year. Next one's September 18th, if you're interested. So you'll register. We'll ask you some questions about your testimony and your info and your church life. And then we'll send you a gospel study. Basically, it's just a little Bible study to make sure you understand the gospel because we want believers joining this church. And then we'll ask for your testimony. Tell us how you came to faith. So then you'll come to a class, three hours of fire hose on the gospel and church leadership and membership and all these things. And then if after that, we've, you know, we've uncovered all the landmines, hey, do you still want to join, sign up for an interview with an elder? And we do call it an interview because church membership, as we'll see in weeks to come, is a job. It's a job with responsibilities and privileges and benefits. So then you'll be interviewed by an elder in that meeting. We'll ask you, one of the elders asks you, hey, could you tell me the gospel in about, you know, a minute or less? I want to make sure you understand the gospel. I want to make sure you have a credible testimony. If you say, you know what, no, I'm, I'm a Christian. I was born a Christian. Well, that's not really how it works. Did you ever have a time in your life where you turned from sin to Christ? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was 15, I, I did that. I've just, I was raised in a Christian home. Okay, I see what you mean. Just want you to make sure you're a believer. Will we make mistakes at times? Yes, we will. But our goal is to guard the purity of the church by letting only believers join this church. And part of this series is we're going to make a shift in our life, our body life. Normally, y'all saw it last week. Then after we've done all that that I just mentioned, we'd say, hey, here's the new members. Welcome them in. We did that last week. I told all those new members this would be the last time we do it that way. Because where we're headed with six more sermons, and we'll have a whole Q&A session on September 5th and October 3rd to make sure all our members understand, we're shifting to where now you will have the responsibility of bringing them into membership. And you will actually hear their testimonies and vote them in. Again, we'll talk at length about this over the next six weeks. 
And in many ways, we have taken your job from you. We want the congregation. Jesus, as we'll see in two weeks, gave the church the keys of the kingdom. And so that's the process of membership. Is it perfect? No. Is it thoughtful and a little bit difficult? Yes. Why? Because in the church, it's only those who know the Lord. And that's our way of trying to maintain that, to build a strong church. That's the front door. Next week, we'll talk church leadership. And then the next week, we'll talk church discipline, the back door. How do we maintain a regenerate church membership, a strong church filled with believers only? Through discipleship and discipline. And again, we'll talk at length, Q&A, bring your questions September 5th at 5 p.m. The church is a regenerate community, a community of the new covenant where everyone is a believer, all on a journey together, helping one another follow the Lord to finish well. That's what meaningful church membership is. We need one another. And God has given us his church to help us follow the Lord together. The church is a regenerate community, the people of God, a believing people. And so we want to have a meaningful membership that lines up with the nature and structure of the new covenant in the church. All know the Lord. Fourth, and finally, the church is fully forgiven. Look at verse 34 again there at the end. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. In the new covenant, God will forgive us. He'll remember our sins no more. And so friends, maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus or maybe you don't know if you know Jesus. Your greatest need is the forgiveness of sins. All other problems can be traced back to that. The fundamental problem is we need our sins forgiven. And the new covenant comes and it offers full and final forgiveness of sins. The good news is God didn't leave us in our sins. Created the world, created us good. We went bad really quickly, but he didn't leave us. He sent his son, the son of David, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to live perfectly, to die in our place on the cross, raised from the dead, installed as king at the right hand of God. And our response then is to turn from our sin to the Lord, faith and repentance. If we do that, your sins are forgiven. That's the call of the gospel. If you have questions about that, that's what we live for, those conversations. And when we trust Christ, we're fully forgiven. Remember, Jeremiah's writing at a time where the sacrificial system was an every day and every year reminder that your sins aren't forgiven. Every year, bringing animals to be slaughtered and sacrificed, a reminder that I don't have access, a reminder that it's not taken care of. Every year, atoning for sin. Every year, a reminder of the inadequacy of the whole system. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But in the new covenant, God will remember our sins no more. It's not a case of divine amnesia. The idea is that in the new covenant, no action will be needed. No action will be taken against sin. Why? Because it will have already been taken care of because of the cross of Christ. It's been dealt with once and for all, which is why we sing. Full atonement can it be. Jesus paid it all. It is finished.